morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Good. It's coming through. <clears throat> well, I've titled this uh, presentation as Not Finished, which means uh, we can all go home. I want to get it. There's a few things that I want to share with you this morning, and really, it's it's the work of God um, that's really not finished. And uh, I want to share with you some stories, and, and I'm sorry if if some of these are a little bit maybe discomforting for some people. Uh, so this man Moose, uh, he's actually in Australia, and uh, he was uh, charged for attempted murder, um, robbery, drugs, multiple assaults. And um, he really grew up pretty much really from the age of uh, 17. Uh, in fact, earlier than that, in the age of eight, he was already involved in thieves, uh, in thievery, and as well as different kinds of uh, just naughty things. Uh, and then it just kind of escalated further and further. And he came to know his biological father, who was uh, dealing with a lot of uh, drug dealings and as well as... Um, uh, he was in the gang uh, world, and so his knowing his biological father allowed him to then enter into this um, new world, and uh, which he was becoming accustomed to. And he continued further in this direction. Um, and here's the next guy, Davy Falcus. Uh, he was a British gangster, so he's over in the UK, and he's been in and out of, in and out of prison since the age of 17. He was in heavy, uh, uh, convicted for heavy violence, heroin dealing, um, robbery, and as well as bank robberies as well. And this guy is even worse, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer in the States. Uh, from 1978, he was known to really kill about 17 men and boys, and his murders really were very gru uh, gruesome, and included rapes, and as well as torture and cannibalism. And he was uh, arrested in 1991. And here's David Bokowitz, and some of you may have known and have heard me speak of David Bokowitz, um, son of Sam, and he was uh, convicted of uh, uh, murdering eight women and, uh, in New York City, and he was really the notorious uh, criminal over New York City, and they were looking for him, and finally when they arrested him, New York City uh, found that they were feeling that they were a little bit more at rest uh, with the son of Sam being captured. And here's what he, what he said, uh, David Bokowitz himself. I was literally singing to myself on my way home after the killing. The tensions, the desire to kill a woman had built up in such explosive proportions that when I finally pulled the trigger, all the pressures, all the tensions, all the hatred had just vanished, dissipated, but only for a short time. All these men uh, committed some of the gruesome... Uh, crimes and they broken they've broken pretty much all of the laws and uh, but what's actually what stood out to me was uh, this particular quote which is really theologically inaccurate but it says a priest a rabbi and a serial killer are waiting in line to talk to St. Peter at Heaven's Gate comes to this quote uh, from this verse uh, from the Bible where Paul has spoken and he's reminded all of us that each one of us, no matter how, whether we've been in prison before in the past or whether we've just been a really good law-abiding citizen, each one of us individually have to appear before God. It says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So this judgment is something that we can't really escape from, and nobody is uh, uh, exempt from it. Uh, but I want to share further, and Paul says it in Romans 3, and he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have, have sinned. And I think we all can admit that we have sinned. At some point in our lives, we have felt guilty. We've done something that was inconsiderate or we've done something to disrespect God, we've done something that we know we should have done, but we didn't do it. Uh, all of these things uh, put us in a position where we have to stand before God. 
and we fall short of his glory. That means we fall short of his character, uh, which is his character of love. But the beauty of it is that in every aspect, God never leaves us hopeless. Amen? Amen. He never leaves us hopeless because the next verse it says, being justified freely by his grace through the what? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. (coughs) Just think of it again. Being justified freely by his grace. So we don't even deserve anything, but he gives us his grace, something that we are undeserving of, and he gives it to us freely without having to think about what have you got, Christiana, to swap with my grace, right? And so he gives it freely to us, and he says this is through the redemption that's already been done through Christ Jesus. Uh, Now, that Greek word itself, redemption, is up. Uh, I'm sorry, Demi, if this offends you, Uh, but it says Apollo crosses, Apollo crosses, which means a ransom in full. So not in half, but in full. The redemption that God gives is a ransom in full. Now, if you're thinking, still wondering, what does redemption actually mean? The word redemption by English dictionary, firstly, means the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. The second one is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Gaining something in possession of something, uh, gaining possession of something in exchange of payment. So what Jesus has done is that he sees that something needs to be bought and he says, I will buy it and I will purchase it. And, um, and he gives himself in purchase. Now, think about it like this. The God who was so rich, he could have given everything that he had in terms of his wealth. Consider this, uh, this quote. Had silver and gold, this is from Acts of the Apostles, had silver and gold been sufficient to purchase the salvation of men, how easily might it have been accomplished by him who says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Think about it. God has all the riches of the world, and he could have paid it by silver and gold to buy us back. He could have paid it by silver and gold. But the thing is, it goes on further in that uh, uh, paragraph, and it says, but only by the precious blood of Jesus, of the Son of God, could the transgressor be redeemed. The plan of salvation was laid in sacrifice. Christ gave himself for you and me that he might redeem us from all our iniquities, from all of our sins. It's kind of like this. Um, So you're going to Coles. I like Coles. I like Coles better than Woolies. Uh, Everyone has their preferences. Some people like IGA better, but I like Coles. And so you go to Coles and you pay, you, you, you want to buy your products, you bring it over to the checkout um, counter, you let it out there, and the checkout chicks uh, would go through the, uh, the items, put it through into the bag, and then says, total will be 63 and 89. Okay, so what should I do? Well, I've got to pay it, right? So okay, so I go and pay it. So you can credit card or cash, whatever it is that you want to pay. Uh, We can have all sorts of different transactions these days. So you pay it. And then what do you do after you pay it? Leave. Yeah, you leave. Okay. So you walk out. (laughs) Now, I've done this a number of times. Not often, but I've done this a number of times. I went, okay, thank you very much. See you later. I've done my grocery. And I go to the car. And I sit there and I'm thinking, (laughs) no, it seems very, very easy for me to get into this car. (laughs) And then I realize, I forgot my goods. All of them? Yeah, I forgot all my goods. So I went back and I said, um... I'm sorry. And then she said, I saved it behind for you. And I thought, okay, well, that's very nice of you. Uh, But 
it makes sense, isn't it? When you buy something, then you've got to take it with you. Why should I take it with me? Because I bought it. Thank you. I'm not trying to be, you know, I know you, you, you're all, none of you are kids, but I'm trying to state a point here. When you buy something, then you've got to take it. And that's the same thing as God. He bought us, and that's, what does he want to do? He wants to take it. He wants to take each one of us. He's not, gonna, he's not willing for each one of his goods that he has bought to be left behind. Now, I didn't want to leave anything behind, even if I paid only for five cents, right? I'm thinking, I paid for it. Uh, Coles needs to owe me my goods. I'm not going to, you know, have this thing, even though I like Coles. But God, in his work of redemption, he promises us when he has bought us, he will then take us. And this is why the work of redemption is not finished at the cross. The work of redemption continues to the judgment seat. He is willing and ever willing and hopeful that each one of us are willing to be one of those purchased possessions and be willing to be taken by him. Amen? Amen. He's already ready. And so how does he do it? So when, before he created the world, redemption was already decided. Isn't he prepared? He is a very organized God. He's switched on. Everything is already ready, laid out before us. Should anything happen, something has already been prepared. And it says in 1 Peter 1.20, he indeed was foreordained before what? Foundation. The foundation of the world, which means before the world was even created, he said, I will go forward and I will take the blame. And this has been manifested in the, last times, in the last times for us. Jesus Christ himself has been the one who has taken the redemption. Now, when God created the world, he created the world with bliss and perfection, beauty, unimaginable beauty. I mean, we see beauty today when we go to nature and we think, wow, that's amazing. That's breathtaking. It's beautiful. It's something that, wow, you know, it's so picturesque. And we go for holidays in different parts of the world just to see some of these things, just for a bit of an eye-washing experience, a bit of a breathing experience. But God has actually created those beauty for each one of us to live in. But unfortunately, as we know, Adam and Eve has taken the fall and humanity is separated from God. The world has become pretty much corrupted. The world has become pretty much in darkness. We are all stuck in this rut. All of us. And we can all blame it on Adam and Eve and say, it was all your fault. In a sense, yes. But you know what? If we were in the same position as them, maybe we would have also fallen into, into um, disobedience. When Adam and Eve had committed sin, God could have went, okay, this is only the first two that I just wanted to, they haven't even bred yet. So I might as well start from the very beginning, right? He could have done that. There's only two people. I mean, and, you know, animals, he could have done. Easy peasy. Six days he created the world. What big deal? But he already had this love for Adam and Eve. Such love that he didn't want them to be missing from heaven. He wanted to redeem them as well. But he had to wait until every, all of these generations, he wanted to redeem each one of them. Amazing, isn't it? Like God does not want each person to be missed. He does want each one of us to be missed. You know, in Colossians 1, 12 and 13, he says, He has delivered us from the power of what? From the power of darkness, he has delivered us and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Look, we all may be familiar with this kind of understanding. But Spirit of Prophecy says that we ought to behold the plan of redemption every day. Because the reason why we're still alive here is because, and the reason why we're here today 
worshiping together is because of what Christ has already done for us. And consider this quote from Desire of Ages. And I thought when I first read this quote, it just took my breath away and I was just left dumbfounded. And it says, Jesus did not count what? Okay, Jesus did not count heaven as a place to be desired while while we were lost. Can we, just think of this. Jesus did not count heaven to be a place to be desired. Yes, to be heaven. While we were lost. He's like thinking, I've got my people down there. They need to come with me. They need to be here with me. And heaven is not the same place if none of us are there. Amen? Amen. Wow. The creator of the universe has deemed each one of us so valuable and so precious that he says he did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left, because of that, he left the heavenly courts. Because of that, he left it for a life of reproach. Because of that, he left it for a life of insult. He left it for a life of death. Well, he went to death of shame. And he, be, he was rich in heaven's uh, priceless treasure, but then he became poor so that you and I could be there. So that you and I can actually gain the riches of heaven. Not the riches of the world. Not the silver and the gold of this world. Not the fame. Not the power. But the preciousness of his kingdom, which is something that we are not able to behold. The plan of salvation God wants to share with each one of us. That he is continuing. He's got it already in place at the very start before the foundation of the world, and he continues further to the cross. And I want to share with you and just remind you, and Baron, who is the expert in sanctuary, he's not here, but hopefully I can share with you uh, rightly in the way that the sanctuary is laid out. So we know why was the sanctuary made and established. God could dwell among us. Here was this tent, this tent, really. And it was dwelling amongst all the other tents that are in, uh, of the Israelites. Now imagine this. The God of heaven, who is patient, who is gracious, who is long-suffering, who is merciful, who is compassionate, is willing to dwell amongst the stubborn, the stiff-necked, the complainers, the backbiters, the ones who murders, the one who actually steals, the one who doesn't really care about God, but all they wanted is their gain. And God himself is willing to dwell in the midst of that. And so he says to Moses, build me this sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And you know, if we, if we turn to John 1, verse 14, it actually says that Jesus, the word, was manifested in, he became flesh. And it says he dwelled among us, which meant in the Greek word for it was he pitched a tent. Jesus pretty much came into this world and he pitched a tent. He became one of us. So then he will actually hang out with us. Uh, so we go through this plan, of uh, this, this plan of the sanctuary. And you know, as you know, well, uh, if you don't know, that's okay. I'm going to run you through this. Really quickly, so the gate, you enter through the gate, there's only one door, and then you face the altar of burnt offering, and then there is another uh, furniture, which is the laver, and then there's another, another furniture, which is the tabernacle. And the tabernacle itself is pretty much like a room. There are two rooms, actually, within the tabernacle. But firstly, when someone has sinned, what should they do? They need to confess to God. But, okay, was confession enough? They had to give an offering. Why did I have to give an offering? Someone had to die in place. Something had to die in place of them. Yes. So pretty much, really, it's kind of like a swap place again. Remember what I was saying to you? Redemption was like a ransom, right? A ransom. So, okay, so you, you've, you've committed a sin, you felt really guilty, you bring your animal to the gate. You bring animal to the gate, and then what do you do? You meet the priest. 
right? The priest meets you at the gate. And when you come to the gate, Psalm 100 says, you come to the gate with praise and thanksgiving because why? God already has a plan. God already has a plan. You come with the animal and you basically place your head, your hand on top of the head of the, uh, on top of the head of the animal and you confess your sin. Now, what happens when you've confessed your sin onto the head of the animal? Well, you confess it to the priest. It transfers my sin unto the animal. So now, who is the sinner? (coughs) The animal is the sinner, right? So now, if we know what is the wages of sin, wages of sin is death. So the animal now has the condemnation of death. Initially, we had the condemnation of death, and God said, no, 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 you don't have to die because heaven is not a place if you're there. So therefore, I'll give you the lamb, I'll give you the animal, whatever animal it is, and you can take it, and you basically come to the gate, and you say, this animal is guilty, and now I am a free person. Completely free. I walk out of the door, and I thought, wow, I've just been justified. No longer that I have to carry this guilt of burden, of sins that are over me. Now, I'm thinking, what is it like to give an animal? Now, this is my dog. He was adorable. He was a Rottweiler. Some people think he's a bit of a pain. I remember Kevin, when he used to come to our, to our house and um, when he was doing Bible studies with us, and he comes to our door, from the gate to the door, he comes to our door, and he's completely plastered with this film of saliva all over his pants and he said I saw Bimo again <laughs> he greeted me with love <laughs> it's like I have to wash my pants <laughs> when I get home and you know my dog uh, became really sick and um, so anyway we took him to the vet and the vet said he's, he's really really sick option is that you take him through chemo because he's got this cancer in his gut um, or otherwise you put him down. And I'm think, we're thinking, look, he's just, he, he's really sick, you can tell. So we decided uh, with really a burden in our heart, okay, let's put, him, let's put him down. So I went there with my dad to the vet and I sat there while they injected the poison into his body. And I just saw, and it was just really, it was kind of like this look. He had this puppy dog eyes and he was just, you know, wimping and he became quiet and quiet and his eyes were just starting to shut and here I was I was bawling my eyes out he's probably like I don't know what he was thinking at that point and maybe he's already out of it and I was thinking at the end of that I was in sadness and I thought maybe this is what it felt like when you're bringing your animal over I mean I can't even imagine if I had to give my dog Look, I mean, I don't even think, I never thought that I would have to die. I mean, I would have to cry over an animal. That was like my first ever dog. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm never going to cry over an animal. And then I just (laughs) cried for days. Uh, And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be so painful to say, okay, I've done something wrong, so now I have to kill you. Because I made the mistake. It wasn't you who made the mistake, but I made the mistake. Doesn't seem really fair, does it? But God said, heaven is not a place to be desired if you were not there. And so he says, the animal has to take it. So what happens is that you come to the gate, you confess your sins, you place your hand onto the, um, onto the head of the animal, and then what you do is then you get a knife, the priest provides it, and you start to slit the throat of the animal. That's gruesome. But I'll tell you what, sin is gruesome. Sin takes us to the point of death, and God wanted to show the enormity and the consequence of what sin is and what sin can do in our lives. So the priest then collects the blood. He then takes it to the sanctuary. He takes it to the tabernacle. And he takes that blood, that precious blood of the animal. I walk away, I've lost the animal, but I've gained redemption. The penalty of sin has been paid ultimately by Jesus Christ. John the Baptist says, here is the Lamb of God who 
taketh away the sin of the world. Here is the Lamb of God. Jesus says, I will be the animal. Do you know that is lower than us? Jesus says, I will be made like one of you, lower than the angels that I've created. And you, and you know what? I will be the one who will take all of the blame for you and me. All of them. Every single sin that has been broken, uh, every single law that has been broken, I will take the blame. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, let's turn to that one. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it's not on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, who made Jesus, well, he who made him, who knew no sin, to be what? To be sin for us. He, Jesus has made himself to be sin for us so that what? So that we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. So then the right, I, don't, I think we don't realize what that righteousness means because we have not lived through righteousness. What we know and comfortable with is sin that is just so normal in this world. So normal to our own natural self. And God says that I'm going to take away the sin. I will be the sin for you. So that you can have my righteousness. Let's do a swap. It's a very unfair swap. But Jesus says, I'll take it for you. He became one of us and he died for you and me. And you know, the beauty of this before, sorry, whoops. The beauty of this is that he does it for us without any, okay, what have you got to give me so then I will die for you? No, he says his death is for everyone. Now let's turn to Romans 5. Romans 5, verse, verse 6 to 8. Please turn to your Bible. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8. So it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for who? For the ungodly. And who is the ungodly? Us. Us, okay. And then verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Right? I mean, you'd consider it. If you want to die for someone, you'd think, Okay, what has he got to, you know, what, how, how has he lived that I might swap my life for him? So he says, for scarcely, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ, Christ died for us. He did not show any partiality. He will die for all. Whether you're short, whether you're tall, whether you're white, black, red, yellow, whatever you want to call yourself, female or male, or whatever you want to call yourself, or whether you're, you're skinny or you're fat or you're poor or you're rich, he says, I've died for you, for all of us. All of us. Every single one of us. Even for David Bokowitz. A man who does not deserve death and who does not deserve life because what he deserves is really wow, multiple deaths. He's taken away eight women's lives and he's attempted murder on other, on other women too. But he found Jesus in jail and when he found Jesus, he says, I'm no longer the son of Sam because Sam was the one who gave me these voices thoughts in my head to kill and kill and kill and kill until I found them surrender and I need to just, just get rid of these voices and I would just kill these women so then I can have quietness in my head. But now he says, I've been free. I'm not free within the jail system, but I'm free inside. Now I'm calling myself the son of hope. Amen? The son of hope. And he's evangelizing within the jail system. And he says to the officials, he says, in all honesty, when they're trying to consider whether or not he deserves a parole hearing, 
In all honesty, I believe that I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. I have, with God's help, long ago come to terms with my situation and I have accepted my punishment. It's important for us to know where it is that we have been wrong in order for us to be able to receive that cleansing. And to be accepting of it. Yes. And here is uh, Davy Falcus. He was pretty much in the gang world. He went in and out, in and out of prison. And finally, before, uh, at the age of 29, he thought, I've had it, I've had it, I can't go on anymore, and I need to find something that will take me away from this darkness. And he found God. Someone gave him a Bible, and he started reading it, and he thought, wow, everything that is in this word is just speaking to me right now. And now he's just preaching to everyone all over the world, and he goes from one place to another. Yeah, he may not have the whole truth, but what he's found that he has, he has, be, he has a plan, and God has given him this plan that he could reach out to every kinds of people who, would be, who are in the gangs, who are in, the kinds of, in that kind of world that, where he was before. And I want to share with you his, um, uh, what he mentioned here. He says, if I can prevent, prevent one person a day from entering or to come out of that life, I have done a lot, said Falcus. The two men that I answered to in the mafia both wrote me from prison and wished me well, success, and everything else. There is freedom in Christ. And here is um, uh, Moose himself. And he, he was just in jail, and he was feeling, oh, I need to get out of this. Finally, I need to, I'm, I'm coming to my senses. I can't continue to go in and out, in and out again. And so someone just passed on to him into that latch, that door um, thing, uh, a Bible. And he said, oh, this is weird. There was a knock, yet there was no one there. And so he took the Bible, he started reading it, and God just spoke to him. And he came away, he was doing a lot of the street artist work before, and then he went into tattoo artist, and then uh, he got into all sorts of trouble. He was still loving his art, so now what he does, instead of painting things that are of darkness, he paints things that are of light. And he gives it to people as gifts. And Jeffrey Dahmer himself, uh, he, while he was serving in, uh, in prison there, he declared himself a born-again Christian after he, was, um, after he found Jesus. And uh, unfortunately, after he got baptized, he continued to study, but uh, one of his fellow um, uh, prison men uh, beat him to death. But you know what? God, <laughs> again, we may not be in prison, but we are completely guilty as well. One sin is not necessarily better than another. We're all guilty and we're all here standing before God. But Jesus says, my redemption is continuing. I've already bought you. I paid for you already at the cross. But you know, Satan continues to, of course, what? He to, continues to accuse. Turn with me to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. I hope you're not bored of me. Because you're all just looking at me stunned. Like, it's either you're sleeping, or either you're thinking about something else, or either you're like, oh, get this, I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> I hope Joey's got something really, really nice. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, look in your Bible. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. And it says, Joshua is the high priest, and he stands before the angel of the Lord. And who is standing on his right hand? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so there's a, there's a difference here who those who read and those who are not reading. Who is standing on the right hand of Joshua? Oh, Joshua. Satan is standing on the right hand of Joshua. And what is Satan doing? He is saying, you're not wrong, uh, you're not right. You've done this. I know you've confessed it, but I've seen you. I know your heart. Come on, don't fool me. I've been pressing those buttons. I know what your temper is like. I know what you're thinking while you're actually in your private time. I know who you've been looking at. I know who, what you've been stealing. Whatever it is, Satan will continue to oppose. He will continue to oppose because what is Satan's mission while Jesus is on a mission? He wants to take the most precious thing that God has bought away from him. And that's you. He wants to steal you away. And so he goes on in verse 2 and he says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord, what? 
The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Amen. The God of the universe who knows already, already our hidden sins and our outward sins. He knows already. And he says, go away. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. He's on our side. He is on our side. And he says, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the, par- from the fire? In verse 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Completely filthy. Undeserving at all to be in the presence of the holy God. And here in verse 4 it says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, What? Take away the filthy garments from them. And he says, Take those garments off. They look, they're old. Ah, you told me already about those things. Take it off. You know what? I'll replace you with a new one. And as though you have always been walking with a new one. That new garment is actually yours. I'm giving it to you. I'm swapping the garments actually with you. That's what Jesus practically did at the cross. Let's do a swap. You take my garment and I will take your garment. Just for you. And so it says in verse 5, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and they put clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. When God has redeemed you, when you have sensed and you have accepted the, the Savior Jesus Christ to be your Lord, to be the one who saves you from death, he will stand by you. It says the Lord stood by him. He's not going to walk away. Satan will be there, and the Lord is like, mm, no, nah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, she's mine. Christiana is mine. Don't touch her. This is a reality that we're always in this warfare. Continually, when the, we are in this warfare, and God wants to make sure that He reminds us that He has already won the battle. Already. Let's keep going. Sanctuary. We're nearing the end here. We're going to the finish line. So then the priest, he takes the blood that we've actually taken from slitting the animal. He takes the blood and he takes it to the tabernacle. Yeah, that little room there at the the back. And the little room here, the first room that the priest enters is this thing called the holy place. Now, a lot of you are familiar with this, but for those who are not familiar, the priest goes into the holy place and he stands before the veil, which is the curtain there, the curtain that's, that's on the far left. You can see the curtain with the, with the picture there. And he stands there and he sprinkles the blood before the veil. Now, what is he doing there? This is, he does this every day, by the way. The priest does this every day. Takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the veil. Now let's go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Or maybe it's 10. Let's have a look. Hebrews 10. I lied. Hebrews 10. Let's have a look at verse 19. Please have a look with me. I can hear the pages of the Bible. Or maybe everyone is on uh, digital. Hebrews 10. Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is what? He is flesh. Here the priest, the priest is actually representing Jesus Christ. And here the priest, he stands before it and he says, oh, this is my body. I am standing before God right now and I'm sprinkling, sprinkling this blood and saying, the blood has been shed and so therefore Christiana, who has just walked away for free, she is now completely free. Completely. Because now what I'm doing is that the priest, Lord, I'm the one that's interceding now. I'm the one that's begging for Christiana to be free. I'm the one that's saying, Christiana, will will be able to walk away. Please help her, guide her, direct her, give her the light, give her the word. She's asking for it. He's doing this for each one of us. Jesus, when he finished at the cross, he ascended before the Father and he's interceding before the Father. 
interceding for each one of us. And it says in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. God does not want us to continue to sin, right? Amen? Yeah. Amen? Okay, good. And if, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus reconciled the broken bridge with the Father. Now, every single day, Jesus does this for us because the priest was doing this every single day. But towards the end of the year, we have this feast called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is a day, a feast that's towards the end of the Hebrew calendar. And as we know, it's a day that happens, yeah, the feast that happens, yeah, Yom Kippur happens only once a year. And so the high priest is the one who is busy. Not just the regular priest, the daily sacrifice priest, but the high priest. He gets busy. He goes into the most holy place, which is the second room in that tabernacle, the last room. And he goes in there, and he's the only one who is allowed to go in there. And he goes in there only towards the end of the Hebrew calendar year. And then he takes basically his blood. I mean, not his blood, sorry. The blood of the animal sacrifices. Um, now, he does this for a reason. Because God has already planned salvation, right? He's already planned salvation before the foundation of the world. And he's trying to reveal to the Israelites, this is my plan for you. Towards the end of the year, all the record of all of the sprinkled blood, I will remove those record and I will take it away. Amen? Amen. So he said, there is no more. When we start a new year, we can start on a clean new slate. Completely clean. It's like a reset. Reset for the year. And so it's like almost this um, analogy. A preacher has, has used this analogy, so I'm taking it on uh, because it's really good. Uh, so it's like your rubbish. Your sin is like your rubbish. You know, you put your rubbish in your, in your little room, bedroom, or kitchen. You've got the rubbish bin. You put all your rubbish in there. And then, when it gets full, what do you do? Right. You put it into the general bin, right? When you put it into the general bin, and then what happens to the general bin? It, gets, it accumulates, and then the truck comes. How often does the truck come? Once a week. Once a week. So the truck comes and takes it away. So our sin, we put it away, and then it gets cleared away completely from our presence. Amen? Amen. I'm not saying that the garbage truck man is God, but, uh, but you know what I mean, right? So God wants to clear sins away from us. Wow, what an amazing God we serve. He wants to clear sins away. He says, I bought you away from sin. I intercede for you because of your sins. And now I'm going to take those sins away. And so Jesus, the high priest continues, sorry. And he goes on the sacrifice of the day of time. And he puts these two goats. One is called the Azazel goat. And the other one, which is called the scapegoat. And the other one is the Lord's goat. And he says, okay, I'm going to take this Lord's goat. We're going to sacrifice it. It's going to basically clear away my sin and your sins. I'm talking about the Israelites here at the time. And we're going to be all cleansed. And during this time, the Israelites were supposed to take the day off. And they would plead before God, each one of them. They would cry out to God and asking for forgiveness. Every single sin that has not yet been confessed is prayed to God. Every single sin. And the high priest, he comes into this place and he brings this blood over to the, um, to the most holy place. He sprinkles it on the Ark of the Covenant and then he goes out. Now, if everything has already been sacrificed, He's able to walk away free, able to walk away alive, in fact. So Jesus does this towards the end of time. Just as the Day of Atonement is towards the end of the year, this clearing of the sins is also towards the end of time. God wants to ensure that each one of us know 
that who is actually clearing away our records of sins? You want to know, right? It's like, well, I don't want everyone to know everything. <laughs> who wants everyone to know everything? But Jesus is the one who knows everything. And so Jesus says, I became one of you so that I can become firstly the animal. I became one of you so that I can become the daily priest. I became one of you so that I can become the high priest. That I will take my own blood into the most holy place. And I will say, Father, it's already been done. Father, I've already seen each one of these persons here, their names in the book of life. And so I want to continue to keep it in there. It says in um, Romans 3, verse 25, 26, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus is looking into the book of life. And I just want like to turn, we can turn to Hebrews. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4. And this is towards, towards the finish line. I'm getting there towards the finish line. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great, what? High okay, we have a great high priest who has, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So we know that Jesus is the high priest. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without what? Sin. Yet without sin. He said, I will walk the, this life on this earth as one of us, and I will continue to walk, and there will be no sin. But I will know what it feels like to be tempted. I will know what it feels like to go, oh, I really want to do that instead of this. Oh, I really want to just get back at that person. But Jesus had no sin at all. And so it says that let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help, to help in time of need. The only way that Jesus is your high priest in reality is when you have accepted that Jesus is your high priest. Is when you know that he is confessing before you. Because you know what? What can you do to ensure that you are in heaven? What can you do? Nothing. <laughs> Not even your good works can get you to heaven. Nothing. You only need to know and, and in fact embrace the fact that Jesus is your high priest and he's standing on behalf of the Father. You're not the one that's standing on behalf of the Father. What Jesus is doing, he's like, I'm the one that's going to stand in front of you, Christiana. Not you. <laughs> you just stand behind me. Don't worry. You stand behind me and the Father will only see me. That's what Jesus says. Amazing. And so he continues to do that. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And whenever we have done something wrong, we can come to him. Lord, I am sorry. But this is the time. We're coming towards the end of time. Judgment is near. Revelation 14, 6 verse 7 says, Fear God for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment has come. And so, my friends, I want to share with you this thought, this story here. Karen was raised in a Christian home. Her father's friend, Robert, remembers Karen as a bright, bubbly girl. She was, you know, a nice girl. She loved to go to church camps. She goes out into nature. And it seemed to Robert that Karen didn't have a care in the world. So she was, she was a good girl. Then she became a teenager, and she started experimenting with alcohol and drugs. Over time, they, firstly, it began, it began with experimenting. Over time, the impact of sin took hold of her life, and she became a heroin addict, a prostitute. Her whole life was a mess. She became pregnant to a man she met on the street. When Karen named her new baby, she called her Hope. It's nice. Possibly she wanted hope in her own life, and she saw that the baby was a symbol of hope. Karen's life went further into a nosedive. She went to jail for stealing and prostitution and left her young child in the hands of her parents. 
After many years, Robert was told, so her father's friend, was told that Karen was coming home and would finally be able to be re reunited with her daughter, Hopi, as her grandparents called her. When Robert saw Karen walk into the room after so many years, he couldn't believe his eyes. Her face was marked and ugly. She was so thin. Karen appeared so ill. She looked haggard and sin-worn. Words couldn't describe how repulsed he was at the sight of this girl who had ruined her life. Then Hopi saw her mother. Her reaction was different. She took one look at Karen and said, Oh, look at mommy. Isn't she beautiful? She didn't see a woman affected by sin. She saw a loving and a lovable mother. You may also feel at times that you've ruined your life completely. There is no hope. But when Jesus sees you, he sees you with love. He doesn't see all of those in front, before you, on you. What he sees are the possibilities. What he sees is that the possibility when I have cleansed you, he wants to embrace you. And he's asking, come to me. Come to me. I will stand before the Father for you, but come to me. And I just want to give that reminder because Jesus really is everything for us. He's our savior. He's our friend. He's our creator. He's the one who knows our thoughts. Jesus is also our intercessor. He's our lawyer. He's our judge. There is nothing that we need to be afraid of to face the end of time if we continue to align ourselves with God and depend upon him. And I just want to ask, would you want to depend upon God? Absolutely. Amen. Nothing else could 
take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace everyone help me find the way bring me back to you Father in heaven, you're everything for us. And really, nothing can actually save us but you. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, that he is our high priest, that he has laid everything down for each one of us. Help us, Lord, to be loyal. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we would continue to walk behind Jesus that we would continue to hold on to the hope of salvation and to know that he has already interceded before us. Thank you, Father, and be with us. Guide us. Bless us, Lord, in the Sabbath day. Bless our fellowship. Bless also what we're about to partake, that uh, it will be one that nourishes our body and bless the hands we have prepared it to. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.